Hey, sorry, the computer seems to be acting up again. Uh, I'm going to go through Hebrews here because another gentleman, many of them, send me Hebrews verses out of context. So we're going to read through some of Hebrews here and get it in context. I would like to remind you that the book of Hebrews is the Hebrews. And it was in the context of them rejecting the sufficiency the Jesus died once and for all sacrificial death burial and resurrection which is the gospel first Corinthians 15 1 through 4 that's the gospel that saved us and this we believe it's Paul uh, that's speaking to the Hebrews um, about not leaving the truth of the gospel and returning to Levitical law and all their rituals and even animal sacrifice because God's not going to accept those animal sacrifices. There is no more sacrifice for sins. He tells us that. So with that context, that's how we read Hebrews and understand. Because a lot of people misuse Hebrews 10.26. If we sin willfully after that, we receive the knowledge of the truth. There remains no more sacrifice for sins. And people think that means if you sin on purpose after you're saved, you've uh, used up the blood of Jesus. No more sacrifice left for your sins. Now that is absolutely ridiculous. And that is the problem when people wrest scriptures to their own destruction. Ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So we're going to look through this. I'm going to show you this. This is him speaking to the Hebrews about the Levitical law and how all of it was a shadow of the new and better testament covenant that would be given through Jesus. Um, and he goes back through the Old Testament and shows them all the scriptures that confirm that we would be saved the just shall live by faith. I think that's in Habakkuk. So let me go through this with that context. And please read the whole book in King James. Because the NIV and the EST, the English Satanic Version, the non-living translation, and the non-inspired version is what I call them. It really twists this one book up. And this is why I threw it across the room in the trash can when my son's aunt asked me about the verse. Because it was like, wait a minute, that's not even what that means. And they're interpreting it instead of translating it and completely mix it up. Because I think the new ones say, if you keep on sinning, no. This was a very specific willful sin of saying, no, Jesus' blood isn't enough. We must also keep these things, do these rituals, the little hand washing, don't eat this meat, observe the holidays. Remember, uh, the Sabbath is Jesus Christ. That's why the man in the Old Testament was killed for picking up sticks on the Sabbath. He's trying to carry his own cross and messing with a shadow of the finished work of Jesus. You don't do that. All right. When God says rest, rest. Now, we who have believed have entered into rest because we know we're saved. John says, I tell you these things so that you may know you have eternal life. We can know it now. And eternal life is eternal. Now, there is chastening for a life of sin. It tells you that here. Okay? But it's only because God's trying to bring you back into his will to be a good witness and testimony to others so they can be saved. To do the good works that we're saved unto. We're saved unto good works, but not by the good works, you see? And that's where people are mixing things up. We should be growing in God's grace and having changes in our behavior as we grow and seek the things of God. But it is very clear in Scripture that uh, it is not something that happens automatically. It is a process that every saved person goes through as they develop in spiritual maturity. So that has nothing to do with salvation. There's even threats here of physical death happening when you reject that and you don't obey the gospel obey the gospel doesn't mean to obey the levitical law the law of moses it means to remain steadfast in the truth that christ alone saved all who puts their trust in him okay you're not saved by an altar call or you're not saved by some prayer you're not saved by asking him in your heart or giving up bad habits or sins you're not saved by any of that okay because god's standard is perfection and so it's through the obedience of one, Jesus, that we're saved. He fulfilled the law. And I'll show you he fulfilled it, and it is now abolished. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And he did. And it says, having abolished the enmity, the handwriting, the ordinances written against us. Okay? So we're just going to go through Hebrews here. Uh, and it says, who be in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself hear that by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of majesty on high all right then we go over to chapter two and it says 
How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Okay, that's rejecting the sufficiency of the death, burial, and resurrection, which ironically is what most people are doing when they use this verse out of context at me and us. Because they're literally saying, see, what enough, what enough, you also must keep the law, but nobody's ever kept it. And it's you offend in one, you offend all, and nobody's kept the law. So, all right. Uh, am I telling you to break his command? Of course I'm not telling you to break his command. I just don't understand how people, if they're full of the Holy Spirit, don't know that you're grieved whenever you do something against God. It like hurts. It's terrible. It makes you feel really bad. And then if you shut down that and continue to grieve the Holy Spirit or quench him, he doesn't leave you or forsake you. He never will. It says, even when we believe not, he abides faithful, can't deny himself. Once he's in us, he's in us. But some reason, people love to glory in something. And most of them at least want to glory in how faithful they are in some way. And that's why they hate eternal security. Uh, but there's clearly consequences for uh, going back on your faith and believing something else in error. That's why he's always telling us to stand fast in the liberty wherewith we have in Christ and be not again entangled in the yoke of bondage. All right, so it says, how shall we escape? Now, this is physical, literal. This one here, if we reject the salvation offered, it's eternal consequences, okay? It doesn't mean if you received it and got into error. Now, when you do that and then you've believed it, you've been born of God by trusting Christ. You can't be unborn, but there can be terrible consequences, temporal consequences like uh, Ananias and Sapphira. Okay? They had physical temporal consequences. God could have used them for his purpose, uh, but they instead lied to the Holy Spirit and they died early. But it didn't mean they weren't saved. They were saved. Um, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? which at the first began to be spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard it. So this is all about the law versus the new covenant, okay? And it says, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast in the end. Does that mean you can lose it? No. He's telling you that you can be partakers. You can have Christ in your life. You can be living in the fullness of your salvation if you remain steadfast in His grace. And I'll show you that here. Okay, because if you try to be justified by something you're doing, the reward's no longer reckoned of grace, but of death. And the wages of sin is death. We don't want that. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to him that believed not. Those of us that have believed have entered into rest. We know we're saved. We know Jesus did it all. We just trust him. I've said before, the problem is people don't believe the gospel. They really don't believe that he achieved it all by himself. So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. And that is him referring to uh, the wilderness with Moses. Okay, he's comparing the two covenants here. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Okay? We should fear not entering into his rest so that we should remain steadfast in what Christ did and not be carried away back into Hebrew law. Okay? This is to Hebrews. This is the context. All right? And it says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mingled with faith in them that heard it. Okay, it didn't profit them. They didn't receive it. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. He's saying, okay, so we know we're saved. Okay, Jesus did it all. He wore our sin. We get to wear his righteousness. We've been reconciled to God. Now we need to get perfected in our walk. We need to get this flesh under subjection and live in the will of God now to serve him. That's what he's saying. Let, let's stop going again over the same foundation. It's already done. It's finished. Stop going back to the law. Stand fast in this. All right. And it says not laying again the foundation of repentance from your sin. No. From dead works. Dead works of what? The Hebraic Levitical law. Okay, that's dead works. You trying to earn God's uh, forgiveness. You can't. Only the blood of his son is acceptable. That's why Abel was received and Cain was not. All right. And it says, Lot laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. So what is the repentance? To turn from the law and to turn to God in faith by trusting and resting in what his son did. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost 
uh, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucify themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Now, I've done a video just on this verse, but it's basically saying it's impossible. It's impossible. You can't get saved, be unsaved, and saved again because you crucify Jesus a second time. Then he goes on to explain the chastisement of those that do that. Because you can't be lost and then be saved again because you're crucifying Jesus again. You can't go uh, receive Jesus' sacrifice and then go sacrifice bulls and goats and then come back and say, no, I'm going to sacrifice Jesus again. It's not possible is what he's saying. It's not going to happen. Okay? So uh, they're not going to return to that and he's just going to leave them and they won't have the fullness of their salvation. Now, if a person gets saved and they do this there is chastisement that is what he's going on to tell you there will be judgment on that person physically temporally on this earth okay all right this is not about losing salvation people this is about if you keep going back to bulls and goats it's just it's done you're just not going to have the fullness of your salvation and you can't lose it and then get saved again because that means jesus would be crucified over so we don't lose salvation. It's actually good news. It's not bad. Okay. So it says, um, let me move on to this. And it says, but beloved, we have persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. Though we thus speak. See, this is about what comes with salvation. Us not living in the fullness of that and actually enduring judgment and chastening of our father because of going back to Levitical law thinking you can earn it by salvation. This whole book speaks against lordship salvation nonsense. That you got to stop the bad works and start the good ones. You must remain faithful to the end or keep your salvation. Your filthy rags righteousness didn't get you saved. Why do you think it's going to keep you saved? Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. And when you say that, you take yourself and put him in place of savior. Okay? It's really self-righteous and disgusting. All right. And it says, he talks about how the priesthood was changed and that's uh, we're not under the Levitical they're not under the Levitical priesthood and it says it is yet more far evident for after that the similitude of Melchizedek which is a uh, Melchizedek righteous king is what that means there arises another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment carnal commandments that's the law but after the power of an endless life for he testifieth thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek for there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Okay, the law is not of faith. For the law made nothing perfect. The law was perfect, but it can't make you that way. It's just a mirror to show you how you're not perfect. All right? But the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh to God. We get close to God because of the new covenant, because of the blood of Christ. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, okay? But this man, because he continueth forever, has an unchanging priesthood. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to maketh intercession for us. You see? You're coming to God through what Jesus did, not what you're doing at all. And he's telling them how the old priesthood is no longer in place. This is Hebrews, people. It's talking to Hebrews. The whole thing is telling them to come away from the Levitical law system into the new covenant because the old one was a shadow of the good things to come. You see, that's what he's telling them. This, the whole book is about that. That is the context. Stop bringing this into the church and twisting it to spread fear. It's crazy. Now it says, and it confirms it, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. He didn't even need to offer up something for his own sin. He had none. He be, that's why he became the perfect sacrifice for us. But now hath he, he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises okay this whole thing is the old covenant versus the new he's trying to bring them to catch up you missed some episodes catch up now this here goes on to explain all these little things they're doing don't drink this taste not touch not handle not stop this stop all this carnal stuff these dead works we do in our flesh and it says 
For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Dead works of the law. He's already done it all. He fulfilled it all. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of of the testator. See, that's why I kept telling you guys, don't take stuff in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John before he died, which is about the kingdom to Israel under the law to show them how they failed at keeping the law and how they could find rest in him. He was always up in the standard. If you even look at a one with lust, you do you think you kept the law? You haven't kept it. All right? He's showing them that. And then make that part of what's going on in the church because the testator hadn't died yet. Okay? For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. You see? But the testator died. The old covenant's gone. The new one is here. So when Moses had spoken every precept, all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats and with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the brook and all the people. I've done some studies on Old Testament sacrifices and how they represent what Christ did, if you want to see the red heifer. Saying, this is the blood of the testament which God has joined unto you. Do you see how he keeps going back to the old law and showing you the new testament? Okay, that's what this whole book is about, people. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. Okay, it's only his blood that's clean, cleansed us. Not you changing behaviors, not you uh, abstaining from this and starting that. None of that. None of it. It's all faith that saves you. Once you're saved, you should live unto God. Walk in newness of life. These are the shoulds, and that's the instruction of the apostles, and especially Paul, to the Gentiles. I beseech you, brethren, present yourself a living sacrifice to avoid the judgment because Satan, and it's not God, it's Satan opening a door to attack you, accuse you, and mess up your life. We don't want to give a bad name. He says also so that no man could speak evil of us. All right? That's why. Not to stay saved. Your righteousness is filthy rags. Why can't they get this? And it says, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year without the blood of others. Can you see how he keeps comparing the old covenant to the new one here? The whole book is about that. For then, why are they taking one little verse when it's clearly about old versus new and, and think it means something completely different? <sighs> for them he must have suffered since the foundation of the world but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself the sin problem was dealt with we don't have a sin problem anymore we got a sun problem we've got to rest in the sun you need the sun that way the sin is purged and gone it's over he took care of it just believe it people don't believe it most people claiming being christian I don't know how they're born again. I don't know because I know the Holy Spirit doesn't come and bless and indwell a person that's believed in a cursed gospel. It's only when we trust Christ and when we place our trust. It tells you that. In whom we trusted, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Okay, you're sealed. You can't lose that it, until he redeems our physical bodies. I don't know why they don't get it. And it says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. All right, and he's giving them the good news that he's going to return. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, see this whole thing is showing them how it's a shadow and it can't make them perfect or righteous. Only Jesus can. He's already fulfilled that. And not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshippers once purged should have had no more consciousness of sin. No person should worry that's trusting Christ that any sin is still on their account when they stand before God. It has been wiped out. We are trusting it. Remember, all our sins were future. He died 2,000 years ago. Don't start. There's only our past sins. That is ridiculous. We sin every day in thought, word, and deed, people. Stop looking to yourself. When you look to the cross, that's salvation. That's peace and joy. Perfect love casts out fear. When you look to yourself, you get fearful and scared. Oh, am I really sick? Well, you're not your savior, okay? Jesus is. 
That's what we have to get here. And people hate this message, like the gentleman that wrote this stuff to me. I got proof Renee's a false teacher and quotes Hebrews, but completely out of context. And I just want people saved and resting. This isn't about me. This is about people uh, not killing themselves, leaving the faith. You know, I mean, I've seen so many people, once they get this, come out of this bondage and fear and love the Lord and want to live for Him and start reading the Bibles and going to church and preaching the gospel because they've entered into rest. That's the fruit of the real gospel. It really is good news. But it says, in those sacrifices, there is remembrance, remembrance again, made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, the old covenant, that he may establish the second, the new one, by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all. So is sanctification a process that you do? No, because your righteousness is trash. Can you be like sanctified in the eyes of men, justified in the eyes of men by your behavior changes? Yes, you can. But to God, you're sanctified, declared holy by the blood of Jesus alone. Okay, not anything you're doing. By the which we are all sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering in the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Do you see how the whole book is about He's saying the law can't save you. Come out of the law and trust in Christ. Obey the gospel. Okay? When it says obey him, it's to believe on the Son. This is the will of the Father. That all who see the Son believe on him and he'll raise him up the last day and shall lose none. But this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And it says, for by one offering has he perfected forever them that are sanctified. Who are sanctified? Those trusting in the shed blood of Christ. For how long? Forever. All right? For by one offering is perfected forever them that are sanctified. Okay? See, those that live right. No, nope, your righteousness can't do anything for you. This is the covenant I will make with them after those days. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds. I'll write them in their sins and iniquities. I will remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Again. Okay, now we're getting to the part that people mostly twist. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Okay? Now, the water baptism is a symbol of a spiritual truth that we were, we die, we're buried, and rose again with them. Okay? It's not part of saving you. Only the blood washes you clean. Let us hold fast. Now, this is the willful sin that they're committing. Not holding fast the profession of our faith without wavering and adding other stuff and going back to Levitical law and animal sacrifice. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. You don't have to question him. You just have to believe God's promise. He's faithful. It says, for if we sin willfully after that, we receive the knowledge of the truth that remains no more sacrifice for sins. He's not going to accept the animal sacrifices. If you sin willfully by trying to offer up a bull or a goat or something, instead of and leave the doctrine of Christ which this whole book is about there is no sacrifice for sins God's not going to accept your animal sacrifice he's not going to accept anything you're doing in yourself as a sacrifice for your sins only his son's blood will be received and that's what this is saying people if we send well, this whole book i just read you all this about the old covenant stop going back to the old covenant see how much better the new covenant the willful sin is going back to the old and rejecting the son of god and it says here if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth there remains more sacrifices for sins but a certain feel fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries okay he's telling you here uh, it goes on to tell you those that didn't obey Moses' law drop dead. How much more will you drop dead if you reject the Son of God? Now, this isn't uh, now if unsaved people never receive it and stay in the Levitical law and reject the sacrificial death of Jesus, eternal death. But if they've been saved and then they go back to the law, you can drop dead. There's a big judgment on thinking your blood animals, your offering is going to be received by God after He gave you His own Son. So that's what this is talking about. That's going to offend God like nothing. All right, it says, For we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, 
there remain no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law die without mercy under two or three witnesses. How much more sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who has trodden underfoot the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Do you see that? This is rejecting God's grace, calling it cheap grace, and oh, that's not enough. You got to do this and that and this. It spits on the cross. This should give those people fear if they read it in context and got out of those false translations and could see just by the context of the whole book what this is talking about. He's warning over and over, stop going back to the animal sacrifice, stop going back to these rituals and the Levitical law and stand fast in the liberty you have in Christ. And there will be consequence for it. So here it is. A how much more sore punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy who's trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. Wasn't enough. And hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Now here is the summation. I had a bunch more in Hebrews to give you, but this is getting too long. And I want to confirm again what this whole point is. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, with ha which has great recompense of reward. You will benefit in the fullness of your salvation if you stand in this confidence that what Christ did for you on the cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection, is what purged your sins and made you clean. Now, because you're saved, you should be living unto the Lord because the Holy Spirit's in you. We don't want to grieve him. And he'll give us the strength to desire the things of God more and to live for others through his love. All right. But not to be saved, not to be saved. If you're trying to do any of that to get saved, you need to get saved. And this whole book, I hope you understand it in context now, is about not thinking this old covenant can help you anything you're doing it was all a shadow and to show us how the law can't make us perfect because it fails because of the weakness of our flesh and that only christ was able to fulfill the law having coming in the form of sinful flesh he had no human father so he did not inherit the adamic sin nature he was all god and all man and his blood is so precious please stop trampling it underfoot saying it wasn't enough now, if a person lives in crazy sin, once they're saved, it tells you, there's a whole section here on chastisement I was going to read you, of how when you're his son, you will be chastised. That's how God deals with it. He deals with his own children. He doesn't take his children, disown them, and throw them into hell. They're still his child. If they're disobedient, he'll be displeased, and there are consequences. If you're obedient, he's, you're rewarded. It tells you right here that you have the reward of the fullness of your salvation the joy and the peace you know all that comes with it blessing but it has nothing to do with your salvation i just want people to get this all right you guys bye bye